Good to see everybody online and in person. So we're very, very excited to have um, 2A10 and Jen Chow Q today for a joint seminar. Um, Hello, everyone. Uh, how are you doing? <clears throat> My name is Chiu Yi Ten. I'm from the uh, electrical and computer engineering department. I want to talk about uh, attack combination from the uh, power uh, engineering perspective and hope that it will give you some uh, perspective. Uh, before I start, I want to get to know the audience. How many of, how many of you are computer scientists? Okay, so my guess was right. So everyone is computer scientist. I'll make sure I talk uh, more linear toward that. <clears throat> so this is the pic uh, first picture that uh, probably uh, doesn't, is no stranger to you. It's a map of the United States. And, uh, you know, as you can see, Texas is by its own. Um, and then Western interconnection and then Eastern interconnections. We have uh, been part of the Eastern interconnection. So whatever happened in Florida, will probably all the way up to Michigan Houghton, uh, if there's a swing occur, oscillation occur in the system or any kind of disturbance. The picture on the top right show you the complexity of the transmission circuit. So that this is pretty much the transmission cover. When you travel across the country, you see the big tower that uh, looks like a high voltage. This is exactly the, and I think that that show you um, that the voltage level can be up to seven and 165 kV, 765,000 volt transmission circuit. So it's very different than the circuit that you had from the outlet. <clears throat> so basically what we do here is uh, power would lost as it transferred from one location to the other. So what we do is we step up the voltage as high as possible. As a result, the current will proportionally reduce. As a result, the loss of power can be minimum. So it's like, you know, you increase the, the voltage, the current will get uh, smaller, and then uh, eventually the power will get to us as you step down to uh, distribution system, and then eventually residential, and then our outload here. Um, what I want to uh, uh, bring across the message for today is um, there is a control system in power grid, we call it SCADA network, uh, in layman term is control network that is centralized in the hierarchical structures. You see that what the map on the top right is can have hundreds of control areas, meaning that it's like different area, there's a different transmission utility. They all operated at their a very different way of uh, how they want to secure the reliability of the system. And uh, one thing in common from this is for sure, we are interconnected, meaning that uh, when, whatever happened in say New York, uh, go all the way to Florida or maybe in Montana under this circumstance. So uh, the theme of why I want to promote here, although it may be related to the physics of the grid, but I want to say that uh, the cyber attack is really raising the concern here on the power grid, even though it is a private network we're talking about uh, in operational technology network, OT network or IT network. And you, you probably may heard a lot uh, in the recent year that the ransomware that's actually getting to us and how things will uh, change. While the nightmare scenario would be, uh, if we get ever to the power grid, um, it can cause uh, some problem when the switching action is being manipulated by the back actor that get into the control system that could potentially initiate the uh, blackout. Uh, in, as you may know, the power grid is actually designed in the way if there's overload, the circuit breaker will trip and as a result, cascading may happen. So there were uh, thousands of, tens of thousands of substations uh, across this map. So this is a control center that show you uh, the situation awareness in the control center. So what we basically it means is you centralize all the measurement coming from different geograph geography that have the measurement value coming from substation that measure power, reactive power, active power, voltage, it's all treated in three phase. At the same time, give us the digital measurement in terms of uh, the, uh, the things coming in the control center. Well, the, under normal condition, uh, this people operator in the control room may be uh, relaxing, sifting coffee, looking around the better forecast. But when there is a disturbance, and now I mean by that, it could be a storm walking through a certain area of the control area. Um, the dot metric printer is still there, they're printing out all the alarms coming from this substation just to promote the awareness of what's going on uh, this day. 
And then all the screens showing uh, alert coming in and out. So the people of the operator will have to figure out what's going on in, within the system. And potentially searching for the root cause of the problem that trigger uh, the circuit breaker trip that potentially lead to a problem. Um, this is a picture uh, diagram came from all the way to 1967. We call it security state transitions. Now, there is a original traditional sense of security in power system and the cybersecurity that we are going to refine in the, uh, in the future. So the security state of the transmission circuit is that we have this secure and insecure and the resource emergency. Basically what it does is that if a trans transmission circuit is uh, being tripped, we want to see uh, the state of the entire power grid, whether or not it's insecure or in emergency. So emergency means that we have overload in other circuit and uh, the implications of that emergency, it will lead to potential other uh, cascading outage. And as we all know, the power generation and load is constant while we are uh, losing the transmission circuit. That means the transfer capability within a power grid will be losing and we could potentially losing the entire system gradually if you are not doing a Ramadel action uh, in a timely manner. So that's how that restorative come into picture that was shed some load to balance the generation and load uh, under a certain part of the frequency. Hopefully it will bring back the grid to the normal condition. This is a much more sophisticated network, but basically this is again a centralized framework that getting the data from state estimation. And then we have this online load flow analysis, which I highlight in the two major red box that indicating that the telemetry uh, meter, the data coming from a uh, hundred of substations. So I'm speaking about as a one transmission utility that could have maybe 300 substation they are monitoring under their uh, territory. Uh, we published a framework you know, originally, uh, we call it RIN framework, is to gather uh, the physical event, alarms event from this diagram. At the same time, we also say that in this uh, new uh, uh, edge that we introduce cyber infrastructures, the security law uh, event, uh, that of, of some anything related to the substation can be gathered to do some sort of correlations that will uh, be able for us to see uh, what are the anomaly that we can infer to and perhaps doing some sort of impact analysis, which is referred as cyber-based contingency here. So this will allow the operating control room and see uh, what are the combination out there will lead to some potential problem. And then eventually, will allow them to make some decision, some uh, an informed decision, hopefully will make uh, fast enough to perhaps save the system from cascading further that will lead to either brownout or blackout of the region. And so all of this is uh, related to power system analysis here, but what is really at stake here is the, uh, the cyber system, now this thing in the control room is all IP communication. So it's not like in the future, we have proprietary information, Everything now is uh, IP-based communication. So the uh, cyber anomaly and the physical consequence of the, in terms of circuit breaker that connect to each substation will have to uh, well uh, be understood in terms of the dynamic and, and, and what are the potential consequence. In this case, the nightmare scenario on the transmission circuit is we don't want the grid to become a blackout. So we have to uh, understand of what are the potential alarm and as well as a, uh, the anomaly in the system. If you look at this picture, we have a, a wide times horizon that came from National Academy uh, that back in 2013 that show you the broad spectrum on the 90s came from uh, computer virus all the way to Trojan horse, all the way to sophisticated uh, attack scenario that we have today. Um, and you know, 10 years ago, if I told people that uh, we have a drone that can create electric short circuit in substation. People might think that I'm insane, but if, for today, uh, the drone is actually more powerful than what we could do. And I'm just spelling out one possibility. And certainly for the cybersecurity subject is that we're talking about uh, malware uh, propagation from network to network, from less trusted network to the more trusted network, it will eventually go into the OT network and then uh, who knows that there will be a ransomware that uh, we are uh, worried about is that will uh, trigger that will disconnect uh, n number of substation. So those are the uh, changes that we uh, actually experiences uh, over this year. 
And so from the data, uh, for data injection standpoint, then you have a SCADA and you have the malicious actors that will be uh, successfully hacked into a certain substation and make some value chain on the system. So the centralized framework of the SCADA will have to be verified on how this is being done uh, in terms of the uh, co collecting some of the temper data measurement. Um, a lot of this assumption in the literature uh, in, in academia is that uh, they make an assumption that the intrusion just happened. And as a result of that, uh, this can be uh, manipulated by the intruder uh, electronically that will allow them to change the state of the system and perhaps uh, it may uh, screw up the market, electricity market. And uh, the things that uh, what we are addressing here is uh, has to be compromised endpoint. And some of the risk aspect is the man in the middle of attack may not be uh, so easy, but intrusion electronically, whether or not it's done by a human being or a software agent, this day might be possible. So this is a conceptualization of all this uh, my map. So what the, uh, I have mentioned earlier that there's a contingency, power system security, what I refer to is, this is a map of the power grid in a more uh, smaller portion as compared with the uh, first one that I showed you earlier that the red color say, for example, tornado walk through it. What we do traditionally, we make sure that uh, the grid will be able to withstand uh, the disturbance. If this line is being tripped and we check all the state uh, of all component around the power grid and to see if they are overloading condition or low voltage. Um, this may not be done in the more exhaustive manners because N minus two, if you look at the storm trajectory walk through a certain part of the geography, um, it may be uh, selected based on the, the configurations of the uh, network. As you can see there is uh, basically the uh, tower of uh, carrying the two circuit uh, on the grid, we call it N minus uh, two, will be uh, analyzed. And sometimes we might do this here and here, but not for this and that at the same time, because they are not in the vicinity of the storm. So the real threat is uh, all this node that we have here is called substation automation system. It, assumingly all of those are uh, substation automation in the system. Then if a hacker successfully hack into the system of this substation, it would translate into, if they electrically disconnect all the switch gear using the local control system, that will translate into N minus 14. So this has never been what we expect to in terms of designing the power grid to withstand that. And so certainly that's not something we want to build more lines just because we are afraid of cyber attack. Um, uh, a lot of this will have to deal with uh, investment on uh, security technology. But what my uh, talk today is to show you the possibility uh, in terms of the, the attack poss possible that get into a substation. If this is 14 and minus 14, if there's a two coordinated attack hack into a other substation at the same time, it will translate into N minus, uh, I don't know, 20, N minus 30. As a result of that, if this is done, it could actually trigger the grid that could potentially lead to uh, instability that have a, a blackout. So uh, this is a picture show uh, a substation detail on remote locking and then you have all this computer system and IED that have physical connection to the switch gear. Uh, and you can see that little box here is the circuit breaker. Any of the control variable here can be uh, done through the local uh, human man uh, interface here, as you probably can see. So um, what I want to do here is uh, to show you the, the uh, S selects one condi condition. So uh, we start with the modeling on the cyber aspect. So as you probably see, this, this is a cyber physical problem, right? You have a cyber intrusion that will hack into successfully into a system. And what we want to do is we want to capture the existing deployed uh, cybersecurity technology in substation that include firewalls. And in this case, uh, we use a stochastic preacher net to capture that. And the rule what we can say is that in, in the OT network, we uh, simply deny everything and then especially allow certain port to go through. Unlike in the IT world, it's the other way around. So we carefully do it, uh, extract this data from each rule and correlate that uh, under this uh, set out of the configuration of the network. And the other model that we do is to model the computer system, right? If there is a password field lock-in, just like what we have today, that could potentially be a malicious uh, activity that could be 
uh, attempt by the uh, uh, malicious actors that could potentially contribute to the success of the hacking in the, in the process. So we have that basic model capture early state to uh, describe the computer system and the firewall. And uh, as you can see here is that the Petri net model will translate that high level abstraction into um, the uh, reachability graph uh, as you can see here uh, in, in this. Um, so to simply put what we've done in the past is we do one substation at a time under this publication uh, some time ago that will allow us to do uh, combinatory assessment later on. But the idea here is if we gather all this uh, anomaly across different substations, we should be able to uh, capture the cyber system just like that. And here's the detail of how we quantify the, the risk and the impact of the substation if the substation is being hacked. So S minus one contingency meaning that if the attacker successfully hacked into the substation, uh, the nightmare scenario will be they will be able to disconnect uh, electrically uh, using that compromised system under that substation. As a result, um, we want to quantify that impact uh, together with the risk uh, uh, state probability that we abstract from the Petri net model. So those are the uh, coming from this uh, and then it's coming from that. So that there's a different network topology we described. Now you may ask the combinations of and select one makes sense, right? Because you have a cyber system that potentially get into that. What about multiple substation uh, hacking? Um, if you look at uh, originally we have the N minus one is all based on the storm trajectory, how you walk through the geography, right? So you could not have uh, N minus two unless the storm happened at the same time on the different location, then we can do a uh, exhaustive enumeration on that. Uh, but for IP-based substation, if we have uh, sub all the substation is IP-based and all the substation have remote lock-in feature, then it will potentially lead to uh, many combination complexity that could allow us to do more analysis. So this is the work that we later on, we include into the picture to capture more footprint of the malicious activity coming from not only the intrusion attempt, but at the same time, the setting of the relay chains, um, potentially some of the malicious switching action that lead to some uh, outage. So these are the temporal correlation that we did also with respect to, uh, so I'm gonna go through this really quickly to show you how is that possible. So in, in this case, we could have four substations at the same time and how we want to capture the impact as well as how to do the ranking enumeration. Because as I said before, uh, if all the substations uh, can be uh, remotely locked in, so as a bad guy, so we have to account for the possibility of this combinatorial evaluation as part of the, our analysis. Um, as you can, probably can see that 61, 64 would have all combination into this. So this is just to give you a idea of how we do analysis and what we do eventually is to take full advantage of the power flow uh, analysis. Power flow is a, a well popular tool that we use in a power system to evaluate state state. And uh, we sometimes use the conversion or diversion to uh, determine if that combination of case could be problematic. So, so to simply put, uh, the divergent is where we figure out if that combination is bad combination or not co uh, good combination. So we did actually going through some systematically from uh, S minus one to S minus K um, to make sure that we have uh, the substation in numerate. And then, so eventually, uh, as we go higher, higher on this evaluation, the total combination may get higher, but we actually eliminate those combinations we already spot out here. As a result, we can systematically el eliminate some of the combination we already figured out earlier. As a result, we can find out more uh, unique combination as we go higher of the combination. So as you can see that under this circumstance, you had 37 we have to use to evaluate. Um, so that is the uh, combination perspective. And this, this is a diagram I thought I should show you guys about the house power system outage would look like. Um, the say hypothetically, if not one of the Northeast system that has been hacked and being 
compromise and then attack have been done at the three locations of the substation in the geography. Um, these people in the control room will certainly get some input from in terms of alarm coming into the system because circuit breaker open and uh, some of the alarm information it was set in the logic on the control system will come all the way together. And you know, this is one thing, but the grid itself have to balance the total generation and total load. So that cascading effect will really kick in later on is that's how uh, we are worried about in terms of uh, the balance of the total load and balance of the total uh, generation is because, you know, when you string the transfer capability of the grid, then a lot of this protective relaying is being set out locally is uh, just doing what it, it was uh, originally told. So meaning that the triso value or the relay setting and all that is done locally, they have to treat, they have to treat. There's no co coordination. It's just purely simple uh, relaying uh, business uh, observed from a local. So that's how a lot of this cascading happened is because when you want to protect the expensive equipment locally, by the same time, you want to protect our economy, then you will have to make sure that all of this uh, uh, well uh, balanced. And, and sometimes we come up with that special protection scheme that we want to deal with. But for the interest of time, uh, I will be more than happy to tell you more in terms of the ongoing research I have. I just thought half an hour that will allow to go as far as I would like to today. Um, but possibility is really the key here, what we want to get into in terms of evaluations of combinatorial to as many combinations as possible while keeping uh, the combination. So uh, with that, I think I will stop here for questions. So we're gonna do a joint Q and A at the end with uh, Jen Chow and Chewy. So make sure you stick around and save your questions uh, that you had for Chewy. I know we had, we had some hands raising at the end here. Very excited to hear from Jen Chow Q. Thanks Chewy for the great talk. Well, I'm so glad to have the chance to talk about my research in unleashing the power of parallelism. Um, today, I will mainly talk about my project, my current project in extracting the fine grain CIMD, the single instruction multiple data parallelism from the data intensive computations. Okay, so um, before we dig into the research topic, I would like to briefly introduce myself. Um, currently, I'm an assistant professor in computer science. My research, uh, my research interest is just like the title in the previous page said, is in parallel computing. And I will provide two courses, uh, computer organization and high performance computing. And thanks to the NSF support, I have multiple opening research positions in my lab uh, for both undergraduate and graduate students. So if you are interested in doing research in parallel computing, so just feel free to contact me. Okay, so go to the research topic. So um, as many of us have observed nowadays, we have parallel processors in almost every computing scenario, from smartphones to self-driving cars, from IoT devices to virtual reality, not to mention the supercomputers in national labs or the computing servers in the cloud. How to effectively utilize this increasing hardware parallelism become so critical for the high efficiency and high scalability of our software applications, especially considering that the value of the data to be processed is usually huge. For example, the data generated from the IoT devices, the banking transaction or purchasing history, or the interactions within millions of users over the network. But before we think about how to effectively utilize the hardware parallelism. The first and the most important question is, can your computations run in parallel? So um, unfortunately, there are a large group of computations that are extremely hard to run in parallel. So uh, we can take a look at these two very simple examples. On the lab, it is a loop that at a constant B to every element in array A. If we enroll this loop, it is easy to see that different iterations can be executed in parallel. Each of them just um, updates an array element based on its values or based on its previous values. So we say this kind of loop is naturally parallel. But if we take a look at the other example on the right, after unrolling, 
each instructions also updates an array element, but based on the value of the prior element. In this case, we cannot simply run different iterations in parallel. And if we do so, the final results will be incorrect. This is due to what we know as the loop carry dependence. And we say this kind of loop is inherently sequential. So one of my uh, research interests is to, you know, reconsider such inherently sequential computations and find the possibilities to parallelize them. So in this talk, I will first introduce, you know, how to uh, utilize the fine grained parallelizations for finite state machine based computations. And then um, we will go further to see for the general computations, how can we get benefit from this single instruction, this fine grain single instruction multiple data vectorization. And finally, I will briefly mention some of my future work. Uh, first, what is finite state machine? We may recall this from our undergraduate course, like the compiler, um, automata theory, or the cir digital circuit design. So finite state machine can be, um, you know, finite state machine is an abstract computation model with some states and transitions. The transitions can be represented as a directed graph, um, just like the upper right show in this slide. So the finite state machine starts from an initial state and each time reads one input character and make a transition. The example here in that um, is for pattern matching. So each time it reads um, an input character and then if it enters an accept state, which is the state denoted with double circle in the transition graph, and then it report a match, the match of um, the represented pattern. But in fact, finite state machine has been widely used in a lot of area like the databases, web browser, hardware design, and I believe it, will be all, it has been also used in the power system, you know, just like we, dis, um, dis, we, we can see in the previous talk. And so considering the fundamental importance of uh, finite state machine in computing theory and, you know, its broad range of uh, usage, I think it will benefit a lot if we can effectively parallelize the finite state machine computations. And if we take a look at the codes, um, the, usually we will implement the finite state machine computations as a, as a loop. So in each iteration, the current state will be updated depends on the previous state and the current input symbol. So clearly there's a loop, depend, loop carry dependence, which prevent it from running in parallel. So to break the dependence, a very natural idea is we can break the, if we can split the input sequences into two segments, and then uh, we run them in parallel. It's quite, um, we, we know that for the first segment, the starting state is the original starting state, but which state should we use for the second DYD segment? It depends on the execution results of the previous one. So, in fact, this is the dependence, right? So to break this dependence, maybe we can have a, we can use the speculation. We can guess, okay, maybe the starting state for the second segment is state two. If the prediction turns out to be correct, then we have finished the whole processing. Otherwise we have to re-execute the second segment to ensure the, the correctness. So, this is known as the you know, speculative parallelization. You know, it breaks the dependence by using speculation and then relies on the verification and re-execution to ensure the correctness of the final results. But, um, if we, but, but in fact, if we take a look at the entire design, existing efforts, in fact, they just explore the coarse grain parallelism which means they only work at the thread level. And so, so that they can achieve at most n time speed up when running on an n core machine. But if we considering the fact that the modern microprocessor, it featured 
features a variety of hardware parallelism from instruction level to the on-chip multiprocessors. In fact, we, we, uh, if we want to further boost the performance of finite state machine computations, we, can, we should introduce the finer grain parallelism to release the full power of modern um, processors. So in one of my previous research, I introduced a single instruction, multiple data, the CIMD parallelisms in, uh, into this um, finite state machine parallelization. Uh, you know, in modern CPUs, a primary example of CIMD parallelism is what we call the vectorization or vector instructions. So this, vector, uh, this vectorization was um, originally designed for the floating point computations in the scientific codes. We want to use some special instructions to um, some special instructions that execute elementary operations such as addition, multiplication, subtractions, etc. But we want to run them in parallel um, so that we can we can have the better performance. So, for example, here um, for the given two vector a and b, so we will, the, the vector result c. Um, you know, will be produced by just using one uh, CIMD vector instructions. The, the vector, the addition vector instructions here is provided by, uh, by Intel. This is what we call the, the CIMD intrinsic. So it indicates that the vector size is 128 bits and each element can be 32 bits. That means we can have for we can run over four elements in parallel. So in the past decades, you know the the modern microprocessors they they pro uh, they provide the multiple generations of CMD intrinsic. Um, each of um, you know they they will be either um, increasing the vector width or they provide some newer computational capabilities. Just take uh, Intel for example. So they, pro, um, they provide the SSE for 128 bits vector instruction. And then they provide AVS to, uh, AVX, which is 256, uh, 256 bits. And in the most recent architecture, they provide AVS 512, uh, which is of course uh, 512 uh, bits for these vector instructions. But of course, there are a lot of criticisms you know, for this uh, AVS 512, but that's another story. Then um, in the latest architecture, they also, uh, the Intel also provide a kind of the CMD intrinsic for, especially for uh, specialized for the, for the deep learning. So with this fine grained CMD parallelism, in fact, we can get significant performance improvements for our applications, just like the bigger show here. Um, in fact, the, the purpose of this CMD vectorization is try to introduce the fine grain of CMD hardware uh, parallelisms in one core. And the multi-threading, on the other hand, is try to use the coarse grain, you know, all available cores on the processor. Then go back to our final state machine, you know, based computations. If we want to introduce the fine grain CMD vectorization, we first unroll the loop with speculation. So the unrolling factor here is two. So in fact, the last two um, instructions here, they indicate that we execute the final state machine computations over the second divided segment with speculation. Then we change the order of this spec, uh, these instructions a little bit. The interesting thing is we find the first two instructions they execute the same operation, but of course on different data. And the last two instructions, they also have the same operation, but on different data. This is what we call the single instruction, multiple data. And finally, we replace the, you know, these scalar instructions with the corresponding uh, vector instructions. And our result shows that we can have four times speed up over the baseline, which just use you know, the coarse grained 
uh, multi-threading. Uh, we have known that by using this, by introducing this fine grain parallelization, we can have significant performance improvement in the finite state machine-based computations. Then the next step is, can we brought you know benefits? Uh, can we bring the benefits to the more general computations uh, through this SIMD vectorization? So um, you know, as our software developers, of course, we can hand code the, the SIMD vector instructions. But if we talk about if we are target on target on the general computations, you know, the hand coding is a kind of tedious and error prone. So a very natural idea is we use the compiler auto analysis and, and optimizations to introduce uh, those fine-grained SIMD parallelism. So the, the existing compiler techniques, they will first check the current computations, whether they are naturally parallel. If they are, then the vectorizations will be quite easy. And there are mainly three directions. Again, we can use the, this very simple loop as an example. So it is naturally parallel. Each, uh, each iteration just um, put the sum results of elements in A and B to array C and put the results of D and E to array F. So the first direction is loop vectorization. We first unroll the loop and then we combine multiple um, instructions across the consecutive loop iterations into one SIMD instructions. Um, and then the second mapper is what we call the super world level parallelism. The key idea here is instead of you know, unrolling and looking around, uh, looking across the loop iterations, we just focus on the iterate of the, the instructions in the same loop iteration or in the same basic block. In this example, we find that in the loop body, we have two instructions. And these two instructions, you know, they execute the same operations, but on different data. Then we just replace these scalar instructions with the corresponding vector instructions. And we can, uh, by using this fine grain um, CMD vectorizations, of course, we can improve the performance because now we reduce the number of instructions to be one from two to one. Then another increasing popular approach is what we call the SPMD on SIMD. The key idea is um, we, we just uh, provide, we just make the different instance of a kernel to us, uh, to the single, you know, SIMD vector instructions. It is, it is similar to, you know, providing the GPU programming model onto CPU. And our, you know, the, the final state machine vectorization we discussed about, in fact, can be considered as a special case for this compiler approach. Um, but due to the time limitation, I won't uh, provide too many details here. But if you're interested, we may discuss that later. So we have discussed that we can see that the compiler techniques can, uh, can provide the CMD vectorizations to the naturally parallel computations. But the problem is if the computations are inherently sequential, the above compiler techniques won't work anymore. So what we need to do is we first, we have to break the dependence. So the, the, the idea here is we use the speculation techniques we have, we have introduced in, you know, in the finite state machine parallelization. We use the speculation to break the dependence at first, and then we apply the existing compiler auto vectorization techniques. Uh, one example here is we have a loop, and then we find that we have multiple execution paths in this example. Um, and only the second path, execution path, P2, will carry dependence, which prevents the entire, the entire loop from running in parallel. But if we can guess or we can speculate that 99% of the computation, they will run over the execution, execution path P1. 
then uh, which which is naturally parallel, and then we can simply remove the second pair and use the uh, use the the above you know compiler vectorization techniques, and then we can of course we can have better performance, but uh, but we also need to um, check the accuracy of our speculation, you know, to ensure the correctness of the final results. Another example is if we only have one execution path and it always carry the dependence, just like the example shown here, a variable S carry the dependence. So to break the dependence, we can, we can guess the value of this S to break the dependence. This is exactly the same as what we have done in the finite state machine computations. But the problem is we are talking about the general computations. The value of this S can be any number, which seems impossible to, to make a guess. Interestingly, I find that there are a large group of computations, especially those computations on, you know, um, on the binary sequences, only several bits in, a, in that variable will carry dependence. And all the other bits, they are either uh, constants or they won't affect the desired outputs. So with this observation, we find that it can give us great chance to make a speculation to break the dependence and then introduce the fine-grained parallelization and thus we can improve the performance. Now we have talked about how to use speculation to break the dependence and then how we can introduce the fine grain parallelizations to improve the performance. So finally, I will briefly mention some of my future work. So in the short term, I will still focus on parallelizing the data intensive computations Expand, uh, in particular, the finite state machine computations and the big stream processing. And I think the key idea is about how to utilize the massive parallelisms on GPUs to, you know, to parallelize those inherent sequential computations. And the second um, idea is I would like to develop the um, multi-objective optimizations because we know that in real world, data processing environment, our developers have to consider multiple objectives, for example, the energy, uh, latency, throughput, um, and even accuracy, and of course, energy. And then I think that would be great if we can develop a framework which can automatically um, parallelize, uh, oh, sorry, optimize the applications based on the given you know, objectives. And in the long run, um, I would like to connect my research to the other front, uh, to the frontier of other domains, such as you know deep learning, cloud computing, and security. And and I also believe that just like architectural design, to gain sustainable um, performance benefits, uh, the future program optimization should be more um, should be more domain specific. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Do we have questions? All right, so, so I'll lead off with, with a question. So, you know, I think that, you know, the, one of the big challenges in, in what both you guys do is that this is, it's pretty fundamental to, to the hardware to make progress, right? So, so how, do you, how do you see these kinds of techniques being you know, rolled into, you know, future CPUs and future power grids and, and how much, how much do you have to do before you can actually create something that then is, I mean, how far away is that stuff? I and mean, what's the path look like? Oh, okay. Uh, in the power energy society, I think what we, if, if there's a, spectrum of how we will balance practice versus theory. I think we were lean toward on the practice. And with today, in terms of the supporting infrastructure in the control room, I think we have every state of the art that we need to accept that moving to the cloud, I think is a little bit tough sell because of 
uh, conservative uh, in terms of the, the, how this utility want to manage their own data rather than giving, say, for example, Google to manage all the data from around the world. But I wouldn't say that that would be an immediate, uh, uh, that would say this would be an immediate barrel, but uh, who knows that one single uh, good business case could change everything. And as you probably may know, Facebook now this they come up with a new name with uh, emphasis of interoperability. And I think that how, how great is, has been the trend over the last 15 years in terms of um, having a different software interoperable based on a certain type of the communication protocol. Um, for the research I'm doing is more on the planning how we can uh, optimize and uh, this combinations of uh, complexity. We can take full use of what he's doing in terms of parallel, uh, put everything in the cloud and then maybe run, run it for a few days. If the com uh, parallel co uh, computing works just fine, I think we will have a pretty comprehensive result, an accurate result rather than the single thread uh, processor uh, to run it for a whole month or so, something like that. So that will expedite that, but there's no real-time urgency, but I'm sure that there might be some uh, real-time urgency. Like for example, this day in mainland China, they have the notions of faster than real-time, which emphasize a lot on the digital tools that they create an infrastructure that uh, close enough to the physical real world and they want to uh, establish a framework to predict what could be a potential catastrophic event and do a quick preventive action to prevent that event. That's why I, I if you realize that I put the eventual picture in the end, the combination and all that, that's the sort of the things that I think in not only in the superhero movie, but I think it's a dream of research. We want to predict the future as fast as we want. And I think that's the merit that we share here in this, uh, in terms of how we can make things faster. Um, yes, from my point of view, I would say, you know, the future architectures, as I mentioned here, they become more and more domain specific. For example, you know, for a specific kind of computations like deep learning or some others, they will develop, you know, the architecture guys, they develop a kind of specific, you know, machines for that, those kind of computations. And I would say my research mainly in the compiler part. And uh, um, my idea is, you know, for, for these emerging architectures, if I have those architectures and I want to get those benefits of these new architectures for, you know, for the other kind of computations, what we need to do is in fact to develop an efficient architecture, oh, sorry, infrastructures to first analyze the, the properties, the features of the of the applications we are talking on, and then try to see how we can utilize, how, how we can transform those computations to fit well on the emerging architecture. So I think this will be a very interesting direction. And yeah, yeah, and, and again, I think you know the processors become more and more parallel. So how to efficiently uti um, utilize the parallelisms also are very also very important. Um, especially for those, you know, what we call the internally sequential computations, how to break the dependence. And that is also a kind of domain specific. You never know what kind of dependence they, they are. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you for your presentations. And uh, unfortunately, it's very it might be general, but uh, you mentioned in your slide that uh, in future computation might be domain specific. Uh, so unfortunately, is, in the future, there are a lot of major areas that are basically connected with each other. For example, you might need to do VR with deep learning and at the same time have a security. And uh, in that case, how can you specific, specify the architecture? For example, if you use one of the specific architecture or computational power for one of them, then you can work for the other uh, area. So how would you handle that? Oh, that's a very good question. So in fact, first, when we talk about, you know, different domains, we will, we will not just focus on where it comes from. We, we can spend some time on analyze the features of these computations. For example, for the deep learning, the, I think um, uh, the time dominant part in that is, you know, the matrix uh, computations. So we can uh, spend, we can focus on the underlying, you know, the computation models 
And then we pick out the features of these models. And, you know, even for computations from different domains, they may share the same computational uh, patterns. So by analyzing these patterns, we can figure out, okay, if the different um, application, they share the same patterns. So one application can reuse the architectures, which is specially designed for, you know, the previous computations. So I think that's where, that, that will be one of the directions. Okay. Just take a look at the underlying, you know, the, the basic computation pattern, and then we can get a lot of hints and, you know, ideas to, to accelerate and improve the performance. And I share the sentiment because I think in electrical engineering, we often use topology as to store information in the matrix and often say, you know, if you have a fat matrix of say 10,000 by 10,000, and sometimes how you sort the matrix in a way how to decouple certain part and uh, remove the dependency so that you can do it as in a smaller chunk. That's often the art of that, uh, how you can uh, parallelize the resource we have today. So this is a really interesting world in terms of uh, what are the platform, particularly the GPU has probably uh, has been uh, the recent trend. Many researchers work on parallel computing using GPU uh, computing power. I, I, I first thought that it was graphic related, but then this is uh, on other um, domain of the uh, applications. Well, we have time for about one more question. Anybody in Zoom have a question? Yeah. Okay. So one question is uh, for Jerry. So I think that so uh, for, for your research, it's difficult to do knowledge in your own process. Right? Are you talking about validation, right? Yeah. Well, um, that's what I brought out the word digital twin these days. Uh, even uh, there's a word company called RTDS, Real Time Digital Simulator, or the Canadian company called Alpha RT. What they do is they are uh, selling this uh, hardware and software together to mimic as close uh, characteristic of the power system without building a real one. As you know, the whole power system is the whole country. <laughs> and, and so th this is a trend not only for power grid, but if you remember the nuclear power plant, they also trying to do the same thing now this day as we are uh, trying to explore a potential nuclear uh, facility and uh, happen to be attending some of the uh, section in the recent year that I learned a lot of things that people want to uh, replicate that digital twins on the physical uh, characteristic. And, and so uh, validation might be uh, we already have some existing tool, but there's still a computational challenge as what we have in terms of engineering is we build a model. And then this day we have data driven. So there's a data driven coming in and sometimes the model itself is incorrectly established. So the data driven might be refining the, the model. And, and so these two are closely uh, dependent. In the past, what we usually do is that the model must be right and the data should be wrong. So uh, we put more weight on the model, but I think that the future trend will be interdependent. The data driven versus the model. And that's why I'm here as an engineering faculty reaching out to computing because there is a need on many, many programs in the country. Like the NSF, they have cyber physical system. It's not just a electrical aspect. There's a lot of implementation that require computer scientists like you guys to make it happen. Like, you know, I remember there was a CPS on the satellite going to Mars. So there's a Caltech faculty demonstrate how they interact with the machine in the satellite, avoid it, flying to Mars, and that require not just understanding the computer side part of it, but also many, many different science involved around it. And I thought that uh, even the same thing for transportation system, right? This day you have to implement computer systems in the car. So this cyber is not just a word, it's really implementation. Awesome, well, thank you so much.